Willkommen in einem and in an aufregendes Video. Oh, welcome to yet another exciting video. In this case, part 46 of my game system design series. In this case, I'll be investigating how scale affects figure gaming, specifically ground scale and using Napoleonic figure gaming. Although at the end, I will discuss how this affects World War II and Cold War games as well. While creating a standard playing areas for Napoleonics, World War II and Cold War figure gaming, I discovered an interesting effect of ground scale. I'm currently creating standard playing areas using historical Napoleonic battlefields. I'm also using historical World War II battlefields, but in the most part, my focus is Napoleonic. Most of my current battlefields, that is figure gaming battlefields, are based on the SPI quad games. When I convert these playing areas into a standard 3 by 4 foot playing area, the scale generally sits at about 1 to 10,000. A few battlefields, such as Marengo, uses a lower scale, about 1 in 8,000, and one battlefield, Leipzig, uses a higher scale, about 1 in 18,000. In this case, I was not concerned about the scale, as I was converting the SPI board games into a figure game format and scenarios, and the time and figure scale were simply adjusted to match the ground scale. For my next set of playing areas, I'm creating playing areas and fixing the ground scale to my base width for the rules that I'm currently using. The uh, basic scales I'm using is 1 in 8,000 and 1 in 16,000, which is what I use for 4 cm wide bases in 5 cm wide movement trays. While this is not important to this discussion, my elements represent 2,000 men or 4,000 men, depending on the ground scale, and represent a frontage of 400 metres or 800 metres, again, depending on the ground scale. The cavalry scale is 1,600 or 3,200, depending on the ground scale, and that also has the same frontage, and the artillery is much the same. The base width, without movement trays, is 4 centimetres, which means the element, elements have a scale of 1 in 10,000 if the frontage is 400 metres, and 1 in 20,000 if it's 800 metres. However, because I'm now using movement trays, because it really does dramatically speed up gameplay, the movement trays increase my width to 5 centimetres, which means the ground scale is now 1 in 8,000 and 1 in 16,000. This scale depends, obviously, on the rules which you use. However, after looking at Napoleonic battlefields, you do need a scale of 1 in 8,000 or possibly 1 in 10,000, and in other cases, 1 in 16,000 or 1 in 20,000, if you're using a playing area of 3 by 4 feet. Now, obviously, if you're playing area 6 by 8 feet, the scales halve, which is a viable scale, but not suitable for one-day games. Now, I just threw a lot of numbers your way in order to provide some background information, but the specific numbers are really not that important, as the point of the video is exploring how the ground scale actually affects the kind of figure game that you have. Now, the main area I'm looking at, uh, or the, you know, that I'm looking at, is battlefields which use two basic scales, one in 8,000 and one in 16,000. And while creating these two scale battlefields, which I have to because some battles are quite large and some are much smaller, I noticed something very interesting. Now, before I actually drill into what I actually noticed, um, I just need to explain a few points about the maps that I'll be using in this video. The first is all the maps have red boxes, as you can see here. Each red box represents a 30 centimeter square or just under a one foot square. Now, if players double the size of the box, the ground scale is half. So one in 8,000 will become one in 4,000. If players halve the size of the box, the ground scale is doubled. So one in 16,000 will become one in 32,000. Other increases or decreases will affect the scale accordingly and you can do your own maths yourself. For this video, all the maps that I'll be using are original maps which I downloaded off um, the internet, or alternatively, I scanned from my books. And an example is on the left. I convert all my maps into something which can be used more easily in a figure game, as you can see on the right, but I'm not going to be including these maps in this video. I'm going to be including the original maps that uh, I download from the internet or alternatively I scan from books. In almost all cases in this videos, the maps do not have the smallest axis exceeding three boxes or 90 centimeters. There are a few exceptions where I have no choice, but I generally do not recommend these playing areas. The reason I do this is all the playing areas are designed for players to be seated for the bulk of the game. 
With a depth of 90 centimetres, a seated player can, with some effort, reach 90 centimetres out over the table, and can reach out 60 centimetres at no effort or with no effort. If players do not need to remain seated for the entire game length, then they can increase the size of the red grid to create larger playing areas accordingly. On the other hand, if players always need to remain seated, something which is occurring more and more as we all get older, the optimum width is closer to 76 centimetres, which is the width of a standard fold-out table. Reducing the size of the red grid can be attempted However, this does affect the unit scale. Now, if players do not wish to change the unit scale, they can use smaller base widths. These maps are designed for 4 cm wide elements in 5 cm wide movement trays. If you do not use movement trays, the size of the playing area can be reduced by 20%. That is, 5 turns into 4. Or, alternatively, each red square is now a 24 cm square. This allows you to have a playing area which is 72 centimetres deep and is optimal for players who wish or need to remain seated for the entire game. If you happen to use 3 centimetre wide bases, particularly with 6mm figures, the squares, that is the red squares, can be reduced to 18 centimetre squares which allow you to increase the size of the battlefield covered by the playing area. My next project is to use 3 centimetre square bases with 6mm figures which can allow me to either increase the size of the battlefield or reduce the unit scale. Now back to the point of this video and how scale affects gameplay. Let's start with Austerlitz. This is a 1 in 8000 scale playing area, which in this case is 6 feet wide by 3 feet deep. You could cut this down to 5 foot wide by 3 foot deep, if you wished, as there is unused real estate on the left. But as I use 2 by 3 foot segments in my playing areas, then why not just keep the, uh, the area and it all fits on my fold-out table. If I dropped it down to 3 by 4 foot, I can't fit the entire battlefield in my playing area, which is why I have to make this width. Just a note, this size is perfectly acceptable for a one-day game as well. The Allies have about 60 elements and the French a similar number, so this can be played within 3 hours if you use a simple set of rules, such as Napoleon at War. If you go for a larger playing area, such as a 6 by 8 foot, the number of elements move up to 120 and it would take probably about 6 hours to play, even if using a simple set of rules. However, I'm focusing on the smaller playing area for our exercise. The rest is a perfectly acceptable ground and unit scale which will give you a typical enjoyable Napoleonic game. Now the 1 in 8000 scale map of Auschwitz gives me a perfectly acceptable game. But I wanted to try and see what would occur if I went up to 1 in 16,000 scale. The first point that you see here is the axis has changed, with a lot more real estate behind each player. The second point is you can include a lot of the pre-battle manoeuvring in this game. The third point is there are open flanks. Many rules have problems dealing with open flanks, and I must admit SPI and Napoleon at War rules all do have issues as well. This can be resolved with a simple command control rule. In terms of element count, with the change in unit scale, each size side has about 30 elements, which gives you a very quick game. In theory, you could play this on a 2 by 3 foot playing area, but I would prefer a larger playing area if I only wanted to basically zoom down to the specific battlefield and use a 1 in 8000 scale. The primary difference between these scale, two scales is at a scale of 1 in 8000, both sides need to really be deployed for the battle. There is no pre-battle manoeuvring. At 1 in 16,000 scale, you could start the game with both forces moving onto the playing area, or at least one side moving onto the playing area with the other deployed. There is pre-battle manoeuvring, and that is the big difference between the two scales in this case. Let's now look at Jena Alsterdutz. This map is a 1 in 16,000 scale playing area, which happens to be 6 feet wide by 3 feet deep. This allows you to refight the entire Jena Ulsterdutz campaign, which includes all the manoeuvring which results in this situation occurring. Obviously, if you played this game out, it's unlikely the Prussians would end up in this position unless you started the game basically at the, um, the time the French launched their attack at Jena. But nonetheless, it allows both players the option of pre-battle manoeuvring. 
If we move down to a 1 in 8,000 playing area, then we can only fight out each individual battle on a separate playing area. This shows the inner battlefield, which would allow you to fight the battle in a more traditional manner, and perfectly acceptable manner as well. This shows the Ulsterdutz battlefield, which is, I think, the more inf interesting battle in this campaign. Both battles would need to be fought separately. In our next example, we will look at a battlefield which probably is not suitable to be played out at 1 in 8,000. This battle is Vogam. In this example, we require a playing area of 4 by 6 feet. And as you can see by the flanks, especially the left flank, you will be missing some critical manoeuvring. This playing area is viable, but is certainly not perfect. The other issue is the size of the armies. At this scale, the Austrians would feel about 80 elements and the French about 100. This results in a lot of elements, although with a simple set of rules such as the Napoleonic War, this is not an issue. If using a more complex set of rules, then the game will take a fair amount of time, but still probably be completed within a day. If we move to 1 in 16,000 scale, the battle becomes more viable, with the flanks available and the Austrians manoeuvring on the left, French left flank possible. The element count also drops to something more viable for, let's say, a more complex set of rules. There are other battles which have this issue. The Battle of Friedland is the same. At 1 in 16,000 scale, we can cover the entire battle, including the arrival of French forces in the Russian retreat. If we move to a scale of 1 in 8,000, we need a much larger playing area, 4 by 6 feet, in order to include all aspects of the battle, and we do miss out on the French rear areas, which are possibly not important. This is viable, but the playing area is 4 feet deep which means that for the bulk of the game, both players will remain standing. If you're young and healthy, not an issue, but if you wish to be seated for most of the game, this may not be optimal, but it's still viable. At the other end of the spectrum, some battles are small enough to only need a scale of 1 in 8,000, as this example of Marengo shows. In 1814 includes a lot of smaller battles, which would also be suitable at a 1 in 8,000 scale, but apart from a very few, they tend not to be not. They tend not to be very decisive. Nonetheless, they can be refought using a scale of 1 in 8,000 only, but these are generally the smaller battles. Another example is Eilau, where you only really need to play this at a scale of 1 in 8,000. There's not really that much pre-battle manoeuvring that it requires, and this playing area gives you plenty of room on the flanks to do flanky type stuff. Many of the battles in Spain are also suitable at 1 in 8,000. Salamanca is a very good example of a battle which can be fought at 1 in 8,000 scale. Vittoria also fits into the 1 in 8,000 scale. In terms of elements used, the French in this case would field about 48 elements and the Allies about 60 elements. This would actually be a very good historical battle to game out. In theory, Aspen Esselin only needs a scale of 1 in 8,000 to play out, but you would need to carefully schedule the forces which were fed into the battle. At 1 in 16,000 scale, you could start with the battle with the French crossing the river and position all the Austrian forces in their historical start position, ready to advance forward as required. As a result, you don't need to schedule or carefully schedule all the reinforcements. You would basically be moving all the elements into the battle um, in whatever manner you think is most appropriate. Now, this battle can be fought at both scales, but at 1 in 16,000 scale, you do get to perform a lot of the manoeuvring behind the front line, which for this battle was comparatively critical. Other battles are borderline. This shows Borodino at 1 in 8,000 scale. Most of the battlefield where the fighting occurs is covered, but it does not cover the Russian forces off on the far left of the screen, which did come down to assist, as you can see by the dotted line. Using this battlefield, you can refight the original plans of each side. However, you could not conduct any of the fighting which occurred before the battle. For an idea of the size of the force mix, using my standard scale, the French would probably feel about 90 plus elements and the Russians about 100 plus elements. This would not be suitable for a complex set of rules, but for a Napoleonic War or something similar, snappy nappy, you could probably easily fight this out in three to four hours. If we move up to 1 in 16,000 scale, this shows the Battle of Borodino at 1 in 16,000 scale. 
As you can see here, the entire Russian position is available, and this would allow you to refight re the conflict which occurred before the full battle began. The bottom of the map is cut off, but if you include the actual terrain, uh, which is a blank here, you would see the road which carried the French reinforcements that came up this flank. In summary, you could refight the entire Borodino campaign, and as a result, try a new strategy. For an idea of the number of elements, the French would probably field about 48 elements and the Russians about 50 to 60 elements. The, this force mix would be suitable for a complex set of rules, but for Napoleon at War, the game would probably take about two to three hours. Incidentally, I had severe issues with the scale of this map. The scale in the top left corner is clearly wrong. In the end, I had to determine the distance between two towns to determine the correct scale of this map. I'm uncertain why this error was made, um, but I did verify against two contemporary maps and did confirm the scale was wrong. For some battles, specifically Leipzig, a scale of eight, 1 in 8,000 is simply not viable no matter how you stretch it. You could create a playing area which includes the main fighting which occurred on the first day, but it does, would not include the Prussian attack in the rear and subsequent encirclement which occurred in the next two days and which was critical to the result of this battle. Thus, if we move to 1 in 16,000 scale, we can now include the entire battlefield. Because this battle was so large, there is not much manoeuvring going on, even with this scale of playing area, but you can at least refight the entire campaign or battle if you wish. This is physically impossible at 1 in 8,000 scale unless you used a 6 by 8 foot playing area. Now we've run through a number of battles at various scales, and the question you may be asking, what does it really matter as long as the battle can fit in the playing area? Why should I care if I can do pre-battle manoeuvring? or not? This is a good question, and the answer is it only really matters if you want to decide how the armies move into their position for the battle. In summary, it only really matters if you wish to conduct a different plan from that which was conducted or executed in history. If you are perfectly happy with refighting the plans the generals have preset, with some minor tactical changes during the battle possible, there is no need to have a lot of real estate around the actual conflict to allow you to do pre-battle manoeuvring. One player um, I know who I tried out these or Napoleonic War rules using Vagram told me there was a simple test to determine what kind of game a player wants. If you want to be able to form a square, then you don't really care about changing history and just wish to refight the historical plan. If you don't care about forming squares, then you may be more inclined to want to command core and refight historical battles using your own plan. Both types of games have their place, but the type of game is very different. On a humorous, humorous note, while refighting Vagram at 1 16,000 scale, my comrade, who told me the, um, the forming square test, was annoyed that he discovered cavalry was so rare and seemingly weak. He specifically was annoyed his French cuirassiers did not have some unique combat benefit which would allow it to charge into 12,000 infantry in column. However, once he worked out that at that scale, that was the reality of commanding the French at Vergam. He quickly focused on sending his infantry to crush the Austrian left flank, which is probably what Napoleon initially was mainly focused on. Now, I must point out the French cuirassiers were a significant force to be considered. But at an element scale of 1 in 3200, the French only had two Carassia elements, which were more powerful than light cavalry, and their speed was very useful in plugging any gap in the French line. The battle did not go as it did in real life, as he avoided the error Napoleon made at the beginning. But the game was a recreation of an actual battle, and each player needed to concern themselves with whole corps, and not just specific Carassia regiments charging into squares. Let's look at a specific example. In this case, the playing area is, uh, is as large as the battle, with little unused real estate. In this case, both armies are formed up close to each other. While some rearrangement could be conducted, if you're playing to a, a game turn limit, an attacker cannot waste time reorganizing his forces and needs, to make, and needs to only make minor changes which do not delay the attack. You basically follow the historical battle plan. 
If we are using a playing area with more real estate, the force mixes in terms of elements will be less and often the attacker will start off the playing area or very close to the attacker edge, with the defender well behind in its defensive position. In this case, the attacker could choose to which flank to focus on and the defender can choose exactly where the defender wishes to defend. Often the result is the player will follow the historical plan, unless of course the historical commander was a fool, but nonetheless, nonetheless this gives you the option of trying something different. There is a problem with playing areas much larger than the actual historical battle, which is the forces are spread out along the front line like a drop of ink in a glass of water, typically. This is a major issue with the SPI Napoleonic War a game system, which is partially con controlled by restricting the size of the playing area, but uh, this is not a perfect way of resolving the problem, because it doesn't really resolve it, it just simply avoids it. One solution, or the solution is, of course, command control. The problem is how to implement command control in a simple manner, as complex command control rules can dramatically increase the time to play a game. I found the answer in a, another SPI board game, the SPI Pre-Stags board game, which had about the simplest command control rule you could imagine. If an element was not in command control, its movement was hard and it could not attack the enemy. This may be too simple for some player, but it works and solves the problem very well. So, if you're using a set of rules where the inclination is to basically um, create a front line from table edge to table edge, on a very large playing area, that would result in some really weird stuff. You could consider a simple command control rule to resolve it. Other sets of rules already have command control rules and there's no need to concern yourself with it, such as, you know, bloody big Napoleonic battles. While the bulk of this video is concerning Napoleonics, I did say that I would briefly cover World War II and Cold War, and so let's cover those two periods. Strangely enough, this scale issue was never an issue as most World War II or Cold War gamers know, you need lots of room to manoeuvre. Otherwise, you end up with a less than exciting World War I situation. Just to note, you know, World War I types of battles are viable and would consist of forces as staring at each other. It's just currently I do not feel they are particularly interesting. This shows a typical Cold War playing area. It's based on the SPI Versberg board game, and in simple terms, the Soviets drive down from the right edge towards the left edge. SPI has about a dozen scenarios which have the defenders on the right side of the river or the left side of the river or some combination of both. This is all dependent on the force mix. I have created this for figure gaming and played the uh, SPI board game using figures many times and it works quite well. But in the one thing that uh, is quite evident is that you need lots of manoeuvre room or alternatively the most interesting scenarios are those which allow players to manoeuvre. Now, strangely enough, I quickly discovered my Napoleonic playing areas were also suitable for World War II or Cold War game. You just need to get the scenario right. And so this concludes part 46 of my video series on game system design, in this case understanding how ground scale affects the type of games players play, want or do not want. Alukutin ding, kommen zu einem Ende.